Hello. Uh, my name is Carrie Bettinger Lopez. I am the new White House Advisor on Violence Against Women, and it is such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you to ESTA, to Futures Without Violence, to Open Square, and the Global Women's Institute um, for this incredibly impressive event. I'm hoping to stay and join you for a few minutes after this event. Um, as, as I've told everybody that I've met since I started my new job a month and a half ago, I've never had so, such limited control over my life. <laughs> so I am highly scheduled, but uh, this is so important. And, uh, and I'm just thrilled to be a part of this. I'm also thrilled to uh, be the moderator for this incredibly impressive panel. Um, and I'd like to introduce our speakers and then um, leave it to them to tell you about the very important work that they've been doing on adolescent girls. Um, this, uh, this panel, as you know, is called In the Spotlight, Safe Passage for Adolescent Girls. We have Judith Registre, Claudia Piras, and Kula Fofana here with us today. I'm going to tell you a little bit, bit about each of them in one moment, um, but first let me just say a few words about what we're doing in the White House and how it will connect up with some of the things that um, these women will be talking about. Many of you may know my predecessor, Lynn Rosenthal. Uh, she has very big shoes to fill, and I'm trying my best, but she did an incredible job as the first advisor on violence against women at the White House. Uh, and that was um, a position that was created for the first time in this administration. And Vice President Biden talks about the creation of that position really being part of his ongoing com commitment to the issue of violence against women and girls. As many of you know, many of you were there in the early days when he was responsible for passing the Violence Against Women Act alongside so many advocates and survivors. And uh, he has continued that commitment today. The purpose of the advisor is to uh, reach out and connect with governmental and non-governmental stakeholders. My job technically focuses on violence against women and girls in the United States, um, but first of all, there are so many transnational issues that intersect. Um, and second of all, the, the administration is really interested in what they call in this last quarter, in bridging uh, the international and the domestic. And so this is a really perfect forum for me to understand the ways in which so many of you are making that connection. I'll just say very briefly, a couple of things that we're thinking about, and I would welcome engagement with all of you uh, over, are um, looking at uh, some of the, the issues of a culture shift, right, and the way in which we think about accountability and responsibility in the area of violence against women and girls. Um, and we have been hearing about this from many of the speakers today. Um, the, we have a, a, a campaign called the It's On Us campaign, um, as well as a task force to protect students from sexual assault, both of which are really focused on institutional accountability, holding our institutions accountable, bystander accountability, making all of us, regardless of whether we are in, individually or directly touched by violence, uh, accountable, and, and including that accountability with alongside the idea of perpetrator accountability. Um, the one other thing that we're really focused on right now is the question of rights without remedies, where those exist, both at the domestic level and in the international space, um, and trying to fill some of those gaps. So if you have any ideas along those lines or, or others, we welcome them at the White House. We will be hosting a summit on civil rights and equal protection of women and girls in June, and we're looking to explore some of those themes at that summit and then in future ongoing events as well. Without further ado, let me uh, introduce these fabulous speakers today. Judith Registre is the program director at Plan International USA for the Because I Am a Girl campaign. And as a seasoned international development expert with a solid track record uh, in international economic development, human rights, gender equality, and women and girls empowerment. Judith has more than 18 years of professional experience, including 12 years of substantive field work, uh, living and working in areas of conflict, and she will tell you more about that. I also um, had the wonderful encounter of realizing that we both speak Haitian Creole, uh, and so we're gonna continue that conversation afterwards. She speaks it a little better than I do. <laughs> Um, next, uh, Claudia Piras. 
is the lead social development economist for the social sector at the Inter-American Development Bank. Her work at the IDB focuses on areas of gender, labor markets, entrepreneurship, and youth in Latin America, and she will be speaking about that today. And last but not least is Kula Fofana. Uh, Kula has an amazing story, and I, she will tell you about it herself, but I can't resist just giving you a few details. Uh, she was born and raised in Liberia, and at age two, she was nearly forgotten on a farm in Grand Cape, Mount County, when crisis broke out and rebels overtook her village. Little did she know that the rest of her life would be lived in a series of crises through wars, violence, forced displacement, and refugee camps. She is an advocate and activist for young people's issues, and she heads the Paramount Young Women's Initiative in Liberia. In 2012, she was appointed by President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first female president in Africa, to co-chair Liberia's Vision 2030 Committee. And she was the only youth representative on that committee. She worked to develop the country's post-war long-term development plan. She worked in the Ministry of Gender to establish an adolescent girls unit um, to formulate and revise policies um, on adolescent girls and young women's issues. It is such a great honor for me to be alongside of all of you. I'm going to turn it over to Judith. Uh, well, thank you. It's a great opportunity to be here, and I'm delighted to be part of this panel and to be part of this conversation. Um, I think I was told to sort of like bridge that gap, and I think earlier in the morning we heard the No Ceiling Project, and we heard the previous panelists talk about, you know, the challenges and opportunities facing adolescent girls. And part of the work we've been doing at Plan with the Because I Am a Girl campaign has been essentially a response. And I think for those of us who've been working in the gender sector and specifically the women's movement, you know, adolescent girls were essentially always within that sort of like critical gap where either we see them as children or quickly they become women. And then when they become mothers, that's when we pay attention to them. But that critical gap when everything is possible, when all the resources need to be invested, is where I think we have been working very hard with the initiative like Let Girls Learn Initiative and a number of different organizations working to really identify how do we fundamentally bridge the gap between girls when they are children and adolescent girls before they bridge that age to womanhood, right? And earlier, we've heard a lot, and we all know the data, I need not repeat it to you, that the gap essentially in primary school with boys and girls has been essentially closed. But what is it that's making it really critical to bridge that gap from primary school to secondary school? In a number of instances, we know very well that, you know, in some communities, schools are not available. Girls have to travel far distance to get to school. But what's been missing in the conversation about why this gap is critically important to bridge, um, to bridge and also because it's the essential gap in terms of what we call intergenerational poverty, is that essentially at that critical age when girls hit puberty, you know, that's when they ripe for the market, what we call the marriage market. And whether we want to, you know, say it or not, you know, girls within the context of many societies are one, you know, a credit card for the family. On the one hand, they are critically valuable, and the other, they are not very valuable. So how do we ensure that education? And a lot of families, for the most part, I think are, they ready and want to invest in girls' education, but how long will this education take for this girl to give back to the family? So that time is so critically too long, and so, you know, for us, we've been working a great deal of work looking at not just investing in adolescent girls for its own sake, while we think it's important, we also recognize the burden on girls alone to actually ensure their own protection from violence, which is not possible because they don't cause violence against themselves. We know that we need to continue to invest the work, but we also need to step back and look at what are the sources of violence, and how do we invest in the institutions that whether or not um, you know, there's an acknowledgement, we somewhat as a society collectively consent or silent to uh, violence against women and girls. We, not, we, know, we have enough data, but we're not outraged enough to sort of say, you know, we know enough, enough is enough. And so part of the work we've been doing have been working a great deal with boys and men uh, within the Because I'm a Girl campaign, because 
you know, the work that girls need to protect themselves when they go into school is just essentially impossible. And to bring matters home, before I continue within the context where we work, this morning on the way here, a friend of mine in New York that was supposed to come to DC called me up because his daughter was traumatized because she had to witness her friend being abused on the way to school. So these issues, when we talk about them, violence on the way to school, violence you know, at the household level. Earlier, my colleague from ICRW talked about the violence context at the institutional level and how we need to do that work at school. At the household level, one of the interesting learning I found when I was working in Congo through this work we were doing to bring the work home was when mothers recognized that I was doing to me the same thing, to my daughter, the same thing that was done to me. When we begin to actually put the investment in the right place, how mothers begin to actually take the direction to redirect how they raise and how they raise their daughters and sons. So to the extent that as women, we have an increasing amount of power because we are raising these children, how are we raising our boys to actually not be able to actually handle that responsibility? So part of our work with the Because I Am A Girl campaign is working with institutions, working with communities, community leaders, religious leaders. We heard someone earlier talk about, you know, where are the religious leaders within the context? Working with community structures so that they, in turn, can actually support girls as they go through the process of transition. Because we can't essentially put the burden in assuming that just by investing in adolescent girls alone, we will indeed solve the violence against girls. And so part of the work we've been doing with the Because I Am A Girl campaign has been an investment in recognizing fundamentally we need to move from you know, advocating for rights to realizing rights and creating opportunity for girls. But the institution, the social institutions from the family level to the community level to the school are fundamental part of that problem. And a big equation to the work have also been, in addition to working with institutions at the community level, also working with boys and men. And I'll end my brief introduction by telling you one brief story. Uh, in El Salvador, I had the opportunity to the uh, Champion of Change program that we implement in communities in El Salvador. I met this young man who was completely distraught as a young boy trying to sort of transition from boy to adulthood and saying, I do not have you know, an example of what masculinity is. I've watched my mother, my sisters being abused, and the men in representation we have on masculinity is not where I want to go, but I don't have another element from where I can actually make that transition. To sort of say, why am I saying this story about this young man? That boys, they are to struggle. They are challenged by their own inability to redefine a masculinity that is essentially linked to what we're calling, I think, in this context, humanity. Because that's why we're trying to redefine what is masculinity in a way that can make the fundamental changes so that when we talk about bridging the gap between adolescent girls, that we can actually do that. And my big discourse have always been, we can't wait for girls to become women to talk about gender equality. The investment in adolescent girls is essentially an important bridge to to, to, to close. Well, that, that's fantastic, Judith, and thank you for situating this conversation um, in such a uh, rich, rich uh, discussion. Um, let, me, let me ask perhaps both Judith and Claudia um, how, you, how your organizations go about accomplishing um, the goals of outreach to adolescent um, girls as well as boys, uh, how you um, manage that. I know, Judith, your organization um, has been involved uh, with storytelling um, as, as a mechanism. Um, and of, of course, Claudia, with the IDB, um, you, you, you um, utilize other methods as well. So perhaps that's a question that could kick off this conversation. Um, yes, well, first of all, thank you so much for this invitation. It's an honor to be here. and learning about so many amazing um, initiatives that you all develop around the world. Um, so yeah, briefly, let me tell you that um, the Inter-American Development Bank has been um, making significant efforts, I would say, over the last, especially for a long time, but especially over the last five years, uh, mainstreaming gender issues in, in all our projects, or at, as much as we can in our projects. And, particularly trying to uh, work with governments in the region to pay more attention and realize how gender equality, inequality 
can really limit the potential of uh, many of our development projects and in how including you know, these issues can certainly benefit not only you know, women and girls, but in general, uh, achieve better development outcomes. So in particular, um, I would like here to share today the experience of one project um, that I feel very close to. Um, it's one initiative that we have been working um, in Mexico to prevent gender violence uh, among adolescents. And um, the IDB uh, has a, an important portfolio in the education sector, but um, in an, our mainstreaming efforts, as, as I was saying, we have been working particularly on trying to integrate gender into our parenting interventions um, directed to younger children, and also more recently addressing uh, and, and testing new methodologies to work on gender um, gaps in, in the participation of girls in STEMs. However, um, you know, despite that we know that, uh, you know, the importance of promoting healthy relationships and preventing risky behaviors among adolescents, um, we um, honestly have not been uh, that proactive in terms of incorporating issues to prevent gender violence in our education projects until very recently. We are um, just starting to do that, and that's uh, the objective of the project that uh, I wanted to share with you today. Um, basically, it was a pilot project to test a methodology, and um, it, it, it had, um, the importance of it was that it was attached to, a to an important rigorous impact evaluation to be able, be able to really learn about the results. And um, I believe we're sharing on the screen some of the pictures of the different activities that uh, took place during this project, which was, uh, we had some important partners. We spent some time looking for the right partners, and that included the Colegio de Bachilleres, which is uh, one of the high school subsystems under the Secretary of Public Education. And um, th this subsystem um, has about 100,000 students in the uh, federal district of Mexico City in 20 very large um, high schools. Um, and uh, we tested this project in two um, big um, centers. And um, what, uh, what I would like to put in context first is the, the fact that, you know, we've been talking of other regions, but as, as you heard in Bolivia from the, from the presentation we heard from Bolivia today, um, gender violence is still, you know, probably one of the most um, challenging development um, uh, gaps or, 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 you know, pending development outcomes that we have in the region. And um, violence in general, and this project goes to the root of how different, different uh, kinds of violence interact and reinforce each other. Um, Mexico has a very pervasive problem of of violence, civil society violence in general. And uh, the, the, we, we were able to have um, data from the second national survey of exclusion, intolerance, and violence in high school that was applied in 2009 and showed that 77% of the students um, would character, have a perception of insecurity in their community. And 90% report feeling insecure in their own school environment. The Colegio de Bachilleres, where this project took place, is not different. Um, the data that we were able to, to collect from our baseline survey practically shows similar results, with 79% you know, of the students uh, having a sense of uh, that their school is unsafe, 47% saying that drugs are sold in their school, 16% saying that their classmates bring weapons to school. So a significant level of um, you know, concern about their security in school and their community. Um, they're also, you know, in a context of challenging um, socioeconomic situation, 40% of these students work, over 30% don't live with their parent and mother. So um, this was a challenging environment per se. So we, we really thought, and not only we as the IDB, but most importantly, the Colegio de Bachilleres Authority had the deep belief that this sense of um, sorry, <clears throat> this sense of insecurity was <coughs> was um, having an impact. Thank you. 
was having an impact in their ability of their of the youth to really um, learn, and um, it was affecting um, their engagement in school. And that was one of the most challenges, the, the biggest challenge that they had in that subsystem, the percentage of students that drop out or repeat in the first year. So they were very interested in an intervention that would address how to develop healthy relationship and create a more harmonious school environment, and that, um, you know, that's what that this uh, project uh, was able to do. And I hope I'll be able to tell you a little bit more. <laughs> that's, that, that's fantastic. And unfortunately, I'm, getting, I'm being told that we only have a few more minutes. I want to make sure that we um, get to Kula. But I think this is a great um, segue to Kula's story. Kula, could you just tell us a little bit about what it's like to be an adolescent girl growing up in Liberia? And also, can you talk a little bit about whether women being in leadership roles translates to gender equality in your country? Thank you very much. Firstly, I want to um, extend our appreciation to the organizers for the invitation and to also thank um, Let Girls Lead as a champion to, uh, for girls' education and leadership. Um, first of all, Liberia in the global village is seen or is heard as this champion for women's leadership um, for the fact of the country electing the first female president, President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, and also having um, two Nobel laureates, President Sirleaf and Lima Bowie, which of course is good. Um, and then the, the possibility and the issues of uh, women's empowerment is also positive. But when it comes to the challenges adolescent girls go through, and growing up in Liberia as an adolescent girl um, is really a, a difficult situation. Um, so the challenges range from um, teen pregnancy. Um, so earlier on, we listened to the presentation about Sierra Leone, and I just, almost all of the things that was mentioned, it just resonates with us about the challenges young people go through being a post-conflict country um, with youth delinquency and then adolescent girls, um, where adolescent girls and young women, the, the, the challenges of, of being a girl. So it is like the generation of my mother and grandmother. So if you're, you have a child or children, a boy and a girl, um, and you have an opportunity to send someone to school, it's only going to be the boy who's going to go to school, and the girl is seen as a possible wife for somebody else. So education is not an option. So um, the challenges now, uh, early marriage, being an adolescent girl, and um, seeing how young women and girls see the opportunity to say education for me should be whether it is available, but it's still a major challenge even, be, even having a first female president for Liberia and Africa. Um, right now, the issue of sexual gender-based violence, um, rape, in fact, um, girls, get raped um, and die. In fact, one of the, I think I had a picture and I uh, sent it to the team. I don't know why it's not uploading. But um, eight-year-old girl by the name of Olivia, she was raped by an, an uncle. And no one saw that as something to bring it, you know, to take the issue up. It was a community member who took that information to the Ministry of Gender. And they pursued that case. The girl went through surgery, and there was so much denier, and she ended up losing her life. And this is a story of a lot of other adolescent girls in Liberia. And then with this emergence of Ebola, you should imagine the challenges. Um, so one of the, one of the positives that you can take out of having a first female president and seeing it has managed to erase the notion that even girls can do something better. Even girls can attain a presidency. So now the conversation is no longer, I will send my boy child to school and leave the girl. The conversation now is shifting. Parents are now believing that even girls too can do something better. But the opportunities, the schools are in safe places where girls can go because they're seen as object, you know? So how do we start a conversation around engaging the schools, the structures that girls go in? And then someone talk about involving the parents, but sometimes even those young girls are their own parents. 
so how do they become, how, what kind of parenting are they able to give on to their newborn babies, to those ones who are having uh, early marriage or those who are um, teen pregnant, and there's no, so the, before reaching to when we deal with them as mothers, the gap between childhood and adulthood, the adolescent is where a lot of emphasis and um, importance for us to really focus on. In my organization, the Paramount Young Women Initiative was founded on that basis in 2005 um, when we, uh, uh, young girls coming uh, from the war, transitioning, so to establish an organization to work with girls, raise awareness, talk about the issues, but also advocate and see how we, we ourselves do fundraisers and pay tuition because girls are dropping out of school because they didn't have tuition, because um, someone want to help, but they want some favors at the end of the day. In fact, the teachers who should be helping the girls want something else. So we taught as young girls, raise resources, wash cars, do things you know, in the communities and pay tuition for girls to be able to attain education and started advocating and showing that sexual, um, I mean, in information about SGBV and, and all can be incorporated in the teaching system. And, and I mean, at least we have seen some progress with the adolescent girls and young women who've worked with over the years. So I'd like to thank uh, this group of, of, of amazing uh, individuals. And I also just wanted to let you know that um, we have a few different things. One is that we've put together a number of articles. And to learn more about the IDB initiative, uh, they are going to have their results available online. Um, and because they are so cutting edge that they didn't make it to print today, but they are going to be online. Um, but we also have articles that several other organizations put forward, uh, certainly uh, Georgetown University, the Organization of American States, USAID, World Bank, and World Learning. So again, these are opportunities to learn deeper about these uh, initiatives that we've heard about today. And we've also invited many of the other organizations to provide their materials and to be linked from our website at Futures Without Violence. So I uh, just wanted to alert you to that, that as you hear about these initiatives, there are opportunities to delve deeper into each of these. So with that, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.